welcome back. Uh, today, I'm going to take apart the turbo vac from the leak detector. Nana brought me a crumpet. So I touched on vacuums a little bit in the last video, why we need one, high and low vacuums, two-stage pumping designs, but I will just recap what that means and, and why it's important for this uh, machine. So the mass spectrometer that we took apart yesterday, this needs a high vacuum to function. It needs a high vacuum so that the thermionic emission source doesn't burn out, and it also needs a high vacuum so that when the helium atoms are charged and sent into the magnetic field and go on their arc trajectory, they don't bash into anything and get absorbed. So how do we make a high vacuum? Well, you use a high vacuum pump. This is a turbo molecular pump, which is basically just a fan that spins really, really fast um, to impart kinetic energy into the molecules of air in hopes that they will bounce out of the chamber. We'll see what is inside this later, but what happens is this is attached directly to the mass spectrometer and sucks all the air out of the chamber. Um, this fried my noggin for a little bit because in the mass spectrometer there are no other holes or ports for helium to get in. So, you, you know, you're sucking all the air out, but where does the helium that's going to be detected enter? Well, I had to look at the manual and research quite a lot, but it turns out that it's via reverse diffusion. Because helium atoms are so small, they can actually diffuse through the pump against the flow of the pump and make their way into the mass spectrometer chamber. This is crazy to me, um, but that's how the helium gets into the mass spectrometer for it to actually function. This is an interesting piece of precision engineering. Um, high vacuum pumps, I know of two kinds. There's the turbo vac, which we've got, and you can also get a diffusion pump, which I think works by boiling oil and then the air diffuses into the oil and then you condense the oil and the air escapes again. I'm not really sure, but it sounds very clever. Um, High vacuum pumps can only operate once a certain level of vacuum has already been achieved because the blades in here spin at something like 30,000 RPM. If they were to spin that fast in air, they just rip themselves apart with the forces because air is pretty viscous when you're talking about speeds like that. So that's why we need the two-stage pumping design. The vein pump gets most of the air out and then once that vein pump can't do anymore, the turbo vac takes over and takes it the rest of the way. And not only do we just have the pump, we also need a pump controller because this is a three-phase brushless motor. Um, and those are great. You find those in, uh, in brushless drills, in drone motors, in that sort of thing. But there's also the pump controller, which is this uh, bit here. So we need to take that off as well because without that, the pump is pretty useless. So I'm going to stop yapping and we're just going to start taking this thing apart. Oh my. Oh wow, that's a good design. Holy Christ. So this is the, uh, this is the motor. The windings are completely encased in resin, which is unusual. I've never seen that before. But yeah, I mean, means nothing is coming in or out. Everything, like everything is just um, completely encased in epoxy. Big old heat sink. Yeah, nice. Oh my god. Oh, I, if I take this apart, it's not going back together. Oh, it's all just loose. Oh, holy Christ. Oh, oh, I don't like this. So this appears to be alternating layers of rotating blades and stationary blades. Um, um, this is really nice, but 
Wow. So it's kind of like meant to be clamped down. Because if I don't hold it, you can hear things rubbing against each other. Um, I actually don't want to take this apart. Because I just know it's not going back together. That is so delicate. I mean, look at... Look at those fins. Oh. Okay, well, I've seen enough. I I don't want to I don't want to fuck this up. I don't know enough about these to fix them. And it's just it's so low friction. Yeah, that's crazy. Now we're going to have a look at the pump controller. We're going to liberate it from this uh, this massive control circuitry that controls the rest of the... the uh... Oh, I bet it slides out. And it slides out. It's a nice little unit. I really packed it in there. Let's take a closer look at this uh, control board. This has firmware chips, it's got brain power, it's got some kind of processing going on here. And I know, I've seen in the manual, you can load in, you can upgrade the firmware. To update the firmware, you had to take these chips out and replace them with ones sent to you from the manufacturer. I wonder if these are UV erasable um, memory, what are they called? EPROMs? Oh my god, it is! <gasps> wow! Holy shit! Can you see that? There's a little window, and in the window, there's the microchip. Wow, what a guess on my part. I'm a god. That's so cool! Holy fuck! Oh my god, that actually worked. <laughs> wow, look at that. So a bit of Googling reveals that this is in fact what I thought it was. It's an EEPROM, which is an erasable programmable read-only memory. So it means that you can program this and once it's programmed, you can only read from it. You can read whatever data it has on it, and then you can erase it, and then reprogram it. So you can reuse it as many times as you want. And uh, yeah, it's, it is erased by UV light hitting the silicon, which is, which is crazy. Yeah, so from the part number on this, this is 16 kilobytes of EEPROM.